All right, looks like we're live. So hello everyone watching at home and welcome to uh, this episode of Builds and Banter. Uh, I want to start off by thanking uh, ASME for, sponsor for hosting us um, with this platform and just general helping get this together. Uh, my name is David Mayer. I'm a Senior Technical Project Management Lead at Fictive. I'll be our uh, guide through this lovely little chat uh, with our friends over at RoboGym. Uh, so to just go ahead and dive right in, we've got a nice little video to uh, intro them. They say a photo is worth a thousand words. And so I figure a video shown over live stream is like 600 million words or something like that. So we'll go ahead and start with that. Most robotics competitions and whatnot, it's very task-based. So the robots are asked to do, like, grab a ball, put in a hoop, do something to that effect. Whereas combat robotics is... You're just going to smash the robot and hope they stop moving so that you can win. So I'm Ryan Scholsky, and I am the captain of RoboGym Robotics. I didn't get into robotics until I was in college. Uh, in college, I decided to join a group. We ended up actually making a robot. I didn't know hardly anything about robotics, so I had to lean on some uh, insight from other members. Hi, I'm Alex Cutie. I'm a mechanical engineer, so you know I'm kind of the creative genius of the group. I'm Dan. I am the driver of deadlift, and I'm the team angle grinding specialist. My name is Michael Rouse. I work on the mechanical design, canning, and some building of the robot. Hi, my name is Matt Burkle, and I am the one non-mechanical engineer. Those guys are all the mechanical guys, but I'm the guy who does the most machining. So the mechanical wannabes, or maybe I'm the mechanical wannabe. There's so there's a weird dynamic. Even before Deadlift was built, uh, we called ourselves Robo Gym Robotics, and a lot of that was because in college we had lifted together. We competed around the country for the first couple of years, building various sizes of robots. Combat robotics, there's like different styles. You have like the really aggressive bots with the hard hitting weapons. You got your spinners, control bots, your lifters, your grapplers. There's a range of all these you know types of offensive and defensive uh, strategies. I think the coolest moment is always when we fire up the flamethrower for the first time. Wow, this thing is going to be great. <laughs> so we were building a robot in my garage here, and we needed to get parts shipped to here. We ended up switching over to Fictive for our new configuration here because it was a lot of uh, tolerance issues that we have from previous manufacturers. You know, the damage is huge after every fight. Uh, no matter what it is, things get bent out of shape, things get broken off, and you, know, you don't have an unlimited supply of spares. That's where the Fictive process has helped us the most is just having that feedback on our parts and uh, being able to make changes on the fly quickly in order to wrap up the design and then get the parts made. So when we're ready to order, we upload our parts, they get us an automatic quote, and once we're happy with the quantities, we order it, and within a week or two, they're, they're at our doorstep. You're on a limited timetable, you're on a limited budget. Um, it's expensive to get these parts recut. I mean, they're all custom machine, very you know precision parts, so Getting them done the right way the first time is absolutely critical. Competitions are usually one in the pits. You know, when it's boom, 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 you're fighting, you know, twice in a few hours. You don't have much time to fix the robot if anything's damaged. So having spare parts ready and still have the robot ready to go will really win you championships. I mean, I feel very grateful that I have these friends, I mean, every year, because we don't get together only because of robotics. It's a really fun and fulfilling aspect of my life. We're all like really great friends that you know know each other back in college, have been through a lot of both highs and lows, and you know being able to do combat robotics and you know be on BattleBots is just a really unique and, and rewarding experience to you know have a lot of fun with your buddies and and build really cool stuff. It's more than a hobby, right? It's like we all derive satisfaction and happiness from, and we all get to share that with each other. To get together to, you know, go beat the crap out of someone else's, you know, hundreds of hours of work is even better than that. All right. Well, if that didn't leave a smile on your face, I don't know what will, because nothing says fun like beating the crap out of someone else's hard work. <laughs> so now that we've seen that, um, I wanted to go around the room and kind of let everyone uh, give a little more introduction to themselves um, before we dive really into it. So if you guys want to go and once again say, uh, you know, your name, 
um, your role on the team and how you started in robotics. I think that'd be a fun way to kind of really kick things off and get into it. Yeah, so I'll start. I'm Ryan Schulte. I'm the team captain of uh, RoboGym building deadlifts. Um, I got started in robotics, uh, kind of how the video mentioned uh, in college, uh, actually meeting some of these guys uh, was my first robotics experience. Yeah, I'll go next. I'm Dan. Um, I am the team driver on deadlift, also responsible for some of the mechanical designs on deadlift. Um, I got my start in robotics pretty early on. Um, in high school, I was uh, fortunate enough to have a battle bots program at my high school itself and have been basically doing it ever since then. So I think we're on year 14 or 15 now, but uh, it's never been any less fun. Hey guys, uh, I'm Michael. Um, I'm a mechanical, uh, mechanical design engineer on uh, RoboGym. And uh, I started robotics in high school with, uh, with FIRST Robotics. Hey guys, I'm Alex Cutie. Uh, I'm also a mechanical engineer that's on Team RoboGym. Um, my origin for robots goes back to around middle school, so doing uh, Lego Robotics. Also did like first robotics competition in high school and gradually transitioned into BattleBots um, throughout college. My name is Matt Burkle. I'm the, as the video said, the one non-mechanical engineer here on the team. My role is primarily to do a lot of the assembly because we build the robot here in my garage. And then I also focus on the electronics side of things. Um, I got into robotics when I was in middle school. I did first Lego League and I did first robotics competition in high school. And I've continued to volunteer in those programs and continued to compete myself in college and now post-college into the field of combat robotics. So all all different ways of coming into this. How did y'all uh, end up kind of getting together and like forming Robo Gym? And was the uh, you know flaming awesome robot we see here the the first thing you guys built, or was there a, a before? Like how did what what did things look like at the start? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Actually, uh, Mike, you want to give a little bit of the background here? Yeah. So um, like we all mentioned, uh, a lot of us started robotics pre-college, um, I think, except for maybe uh, Ryan. But interestingly enough, uh, Ryan and Matt were kind of the, the first two founders of what became our college organization. So so Matt kind of led a group that was more like first in high school, and uh, Ryan led a, a group that became kind of the combat robotics arm in college. And that's kind of how we all met. Uh, first, I met Ryan and Dan, and then later Matt and Alex. And after college, you know, we still we enjoyed the sport immensely, and and we wanted to continue. So we kind of coalesced and, and formed RoboGym so we could keep competing after college. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, in addition to BattleBots too, we uh, we do other various tournaments. So um, t tournaments that are kind of you know more on the amateur circuit. So you know we kind of go around the country building various sizes of robots. Uh, we even compete against each other sometimes, which is always a fun little bit of friendly competition. Yeah, one thing I also want to point out. Sorry, sorry. What one thing I just wanted to point out too is that um, that wasn't mentioned is that Dan in college started an actual uh, combat robotics competition within the club that we were all a part of, and that was one thing I think that really helped bring us together as well because we all decided to compete in that competition against each other, and it was supporting our old club because we were competing in the competition in its early days. And we all, you know, also got to like come down and see each other for that time. And we were alumni, so it was kind of like an alumni gathering. It's, it was essentially our homecoming coming back to campus for this competition. Um, so yeah, and you can see here, these, these are two of the robots. Uh, the yellow one on the left, Rat Catcher built by Dan, and the red one on the right, Bot Seps built by Ryan. Very cool. Looks like some little windows into the past. So uh, yeah, and you can kind your... of see here, uh, based on the color scheme, we didn't really quite have that unifying uh, theme and logo that we do now, um, and that's kind of evolved over time as we got into uh, the BattleBots TV show. So uh, things look a little more like this, I believe. Yeah, yeah. This is a, this is a much more uh, updated and newer uh, picture of our of yeah our, our theme here. Yeah, this is our our newer branding image. 
<laughs> with some very tactically hidden uh, battle damage. This was actually taken after the tournament we were in together, um, and the robots were not in super great shape afterwards, but, you know, they're looking <laughs> nice in the post photo. Yeah, a lot of damage top plates there, <laughs> hence why one is not being shown. But <laughs> with the uh, inner team fighting, who ended up winning? I'm not, I know that's a maybe dangerous question to ask, but I'm curious. Uh, perhaps Ooh. we should pull up slide 15. <laughs> it's a video <laughs> there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a good one. It's not too long. Three, two, one. Yeah, that was actually, uh, that was me versus Ryan, um, in the rare victory that, uh, I take over him, but, uh, you know, it's it's a lot of give and take normally because, you know, we've been doing it for so many years and we fought each other for, you know, a number of times after that. So sometimes you win and sometimes you get your weapon exploded into a thousand pieces. Yeah, it seems like a and pretty... Fun uh, fact about victory. that fight, too. Um, I think that was probably the longest fight I had that year. <laughs> competition. <laughs> Total of, like, four seconds. Yeah, I'd say early on Ryan's robot was quite dominant. Yeah, for sure. So the rest of us had a lot of catching up to do for a while. Well, well, all that kind of sparked some questions in my head. So I'm just going to kind of dive into those because I, you know, a mechanical engineer, love robotics, uh, just from watching them love, you know, things fighting each other. But I actually don't know a whole lot about the world of combat robotics and kind of what it entails because. You know, I know robots can go anywhere from the little Lego mind storms that sounds like a couple of you guys started with all the way up to, uh, you know, Boston Dynamics and Atlas and uh, KUKA arms and all those crazy robots that I'm still convinced run off of black magic. Uh, <laughs> so kind of how would you guys just for someone who's, you know, not a lot of experience describe just what what does it take to build a combat robot? Like, where does it fall on the scale? What what is a combat robot? Yeah. Uh, Ryan, you want to take that one? Yeah, I can take it. Um, so combat robotics is, they're actually very simple from a electronic standpoint, um, which surprises a lot of people. A lot of people think it's, you know, pretty complex electronics and everything, powering the robots. However, it's pretty much just a RC car on steroids. We're using a lot of RC components, so it's a transmitter receiver. And then a lot of the motors and everything are just powered off a standard speed controller used in RC cars, um, usually very large scale RC cars, uh, even at 30 pound competitions. Um, so it's basically the goal of building a combat robot is not necessarily the complexity, it's actually more the opposite. You want to keep it as simple as possible. That way, less things can go wrong at, during the battle. You know, if you get hit, jostled around, you want only one mode of failure versus multiple points that can go wrong in your robots. Um, hence why we tend to use, you know, simple systems, um, even with our lifter arm. We could even put stuff like we could put limit switches on the arm to detect when it's at certain points to kind of, you know, protect the robot a little bit. But we opt to not put those on and just have it, you know, all manual control um, from the transmitter. Um, so that that way we don't have to worry about the limits, which is failing and potentially causing a problem during a match. Yeah, so I think interestingly, it... the complication in the in the electronic side of things is mostly pushed outside of the control or outside of, for the most part, outside of the competitor's hands, because you're looking at these very high powered, high current electronic speed controllers and like the there is electronics design that goes into those, but most teams just buy off the shelf parts. It's similar to saying that like, oh, well, when you build a computer, you don't design a CPU, you, you buy the CPU from Intel, but you know, that CPU is very complicated. And similarly, in, inside of these electronics components that we, we buy, there's been a lot of engineering put into it, but for the sake of a, a competitor in BattleBots, you can just take that complicated thing and use it as a simple black box. 
Yeah, I think I think a lot of the design work on our end is more of one of optimization. Um, in in a lot of the, uh, the the tournaments that we enter, uh, the limiting factor is weight. Well, of course, cost too, but but weight's the big one. So we have, you know, for BattleBots, we have 250 pounds to play around with, which sounds like a lot, but but everything's very heavy. And if you want to protect yourself and also make sure you can control and and damage the enemy, that that weight gets eaten up pretty quickly. So I think a lot of our design work and complexi complexity is to make sure our systems are robust while also being very lightweight. And, and adding on to that from, yeah, getting more into the mechanical side of things where a lot of our, our effort goes into, um, it, BattleBots is a very interesting, both engineering problem and sport in the sense that um, it's this machine that is taking, dealing out and taking lots of damage from fight to fight. And when it comes down to like, you know, an actual tournament and like progressing through multiple rounds, there is a extremely heavy consideration towards like, reliability, repairability, and, and like being able to win the war, like what, I, don't, I think what the phrase is, but you know, having to like progress through all of these versus like getting towards the end, some limping state, and then you just get eliminated further down the competition when the, the stakes get higher and higher. So there's a lot of various factors that from the surface, you know, are not evident if you just watch like a single fight, but when you're actually like doing this for a, a, like a full period, full competition, um, there's a lot of things over the years we've learned and incorporate when it comes to designing and doing trade-offs from like all the previously mentioned aspects of, of, you know, design engineering. So would it be fair to say that the, uh, the challenge of BattleBots, or at least one of them is, uh, it's not complexity, it's, uh, simplicity is the challenge and within making things simple is when things get complex. Yeah, that's a that's an excellent way of putting it. Um, because essentially, when you think about it, right, if you have the minimum number of failure points, then ideally, you'll have the minimum number of failures as well, or at least you have the minimum number of aspects to focus on when you're designing the bot. Um, and, you know, when it comes to simple, it's not just necessarily about simplicity, it's also about reliability, or the ability to perform through a set of circumstances. So you know, it is an engineering challenge in the sense that, you know, you're designing this um, machine to, you know, kind of go through the ropes of getting hit by other robots, getting grabbed, tossed, burned, et cetera. Uh, but you are on a very stringent set of requirements, which basically say that no matter what you do, you're going to take damage. It's a matter of making sure that damage does not render your robot inoperable. Been uh, fictive. I've uh, said many a time that the, uh, from a manufacturing standpoint, the best part ever is a block of aluminum. Um, which obviously doesn't do many people very good, but it is the simplest. So it sounds like you guys have uh, kind of a similar challenge of the, the most reliable battle bots, just a block of steel, but that might not do too well in a fight. Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that's certainly a good point. Um, I will say in general, you know, starting from a block of aluminum, even on a battle bot, it's a good place to start off from. Uh, like a lot of our frame, for example, is uh, CNC'd giant bars of aluminum. Um, and we've actually had, uh, even from other builders, many comments talking about, you know, man, you guys have a really thick, durable frame. Um, and that's something that has absolutely been a boon to us throughout the competition in terms of staying alive in matches. Yeah. Well, um... I'll go ahead and then take that because I'm curious. And also for the audience, take a pr uh, quick pause and plug. We do have a Q&A uh, section uh, at the end of this webinar. We'll be taking some time to answer those questions. But if we have uh, some particularly relevant ones, I'll kind of sprinkle them in. Um, we've already got two users have some good questions that I'll kind of take um, into my next uh, question, which is about what some of the challenges and obstacles are. So. Uh, the questions we got from the audience are, do you have any trouble getting enough uh, torque or energy density for destruction? And kind of related, uh, if you don't, how much energy does that take? Um, specifically, how much battery do you guys need? Because it's, you know, you're trying to beat up a piece of metal, which usually takes a lot of energy. So what does that, how much energy does that take? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Ryan, do you want to kind of talk through a little bit uh, about the ARM power transmission and, and some of the power consumption aspects there? Yeah, so for the ARM, um, especially with the like um, 
electric motors that we use in deadlift, they're very power dense. Um, so you usually gain the, the torque output is not a problem. The problem is designing a gear train to not only handle that torque, but also handle any shocks and impacts while you're using the arm. So because we have a lifter grabber type uh, configuration, we could grab another robot and as we grab them, their weapon could hit our arm or something like that. So our um, drivetrain for the, the arm has to not only handle the torque of the motor kind of stalling out when you grab another robot, but also handle getting hit at the same time while stalling out, which ends up being an incredible amount of force. Um, so the biggest challenge that we had as far as designing it is just making sure that we have like a large enough gears on there and we actually had some gears custom made from Fictive um, to actually allow us to handle this type of torque um, just because we couldn't buy anything off the shelf and if we tried to buy off the shelf it was way too heavy for what we needed. Um, so that was the other thing it's, it's just you know making it be able to be designed so it's way overkill for you know x amount of torque coming out of the motor but then also making sure it's light enough to fit within our 250 pound uh, weight limit that we have for the robot. Um, and then as far as battery consumption goes, um, the ironic part is for, for a lifter grabber type robot, we actually don't use too much battery during a fight. Um, a lot of the battery that we use is through the drivetrain. The arm doesn't consume as much um, of the battery per percentage because the drivetrain is constantly moving over the full three minutes. Um, you're running into the robots, you're picking out a robot, you're stalling all four drive motors that we have in the robot. Um, so that typically takes um, a lot of energy in order to do that, um, especially moving 250 and then pushing the other robot moving 500 pounds in total. Um, but um, our batteries are actually, I think we have eight um, amp hours at, two eight amp hour batteries at um, 8S, if I'm remembering correctly. And those seem to handle our um, fights no problem for three minutes. Um, usually what we're limited to in BattleBots is how much amperage those batteries can output at one given time. So what happens to um, these LiPos is once you try to draw a ton of current out of the batteries, they have a voltage sag. So you get less energy out of them um, when that happens. So the robot doesn't respond as quickly and doesn't output as much power as you want during those times where it really needs it. So what a lot of builders do, and us included, is we kind of oversize the batteries so that that way, when you do need those power draws, it can handle, it can push more current to the motors and whatnot um, for the match. Um, but yeah, and if anyone has anything else to add to that, feel free to. Yeah, I think one thing to add on to that, um, this is kind of going to the general like power torque, you know, requirements of BattleBots. Um, keep on going back to kind of like a like an optimization, like efficiency problem in the grand scheme of things. And one thing that, you know, a lot of builders, but we've kind of, you know, default to now is, is sticking with, let's say, like brushless motors and just a lot more power dense technology. Um, Cause you know, BattleBots as a sport has been around for going on like two decades now. And over the lifetime of this, of this sport, um, you know, there's been a drastic change in, in both battery tech and motor tech. Um, and so, you know, back in the day, there are these really heavy, um, not so powerful, like brush DC motors. And nowadays, like something that used to weigh like 20, 30 pounds, you can get almost the same, you know, torque power output in like a fraction, like a fifth the size. Um, and adding on to that, like understanding, you know, what, what like you're, you're actually able to utilize from like a traction standpoint from the drivetrain, you know, um, torque, like maximum torque and speeds and everything for like a lifter arm, you know, really deciding of what is going to be sufficient, but not be overkill because again, you're limited by overall battery and weight and size. So it's just like this, this, you know, these trade offs all around, um, they have to keep in mind. So speaking of trade offs all around, I'm going to kind of jump in and, uh, ask, uh, uh, just jump to the point, what's the hardest engineering challenge you guys had building this? Like, I know we've already touched on batteries, touched on simplicity, but like, I imagine there's one thing in here that was just the, the, the thing that almost kicked your ass in getting this made. And like, what, what was that and how'd you guys work through it? 
Actually, uh, Matt, do you want to talk about maybe some of the electronic architecture challenges we had? Yeah, yeah, that was the thing that came to my mind too. Um, <laughs> so this this journey happened primarily in our first iteration of Deadlift, which was on season five of BattleBots, and this was our first time journeying into the 250 pound weight class. Prior robots that we built were all 60 pounds or lighter. So that required us to do research, figure out what electronic speed controllers, what motors would be appropriate and pick those, but we still didn't really have experience with it. Um, and so we picked an, an electronic speed controller that was very compact and we were trying to get it to work. And our plan was originally to use it in sensorless operation and brushless motors, they can operate in sensored or sensorless operation and for some reason the electronic speed controllers were having troubles getting the motors kick-started and getting them going so you know we looked back on this and we said okay maybe we need to add sensors so that's what we did we but but you know the biggest challenge here was we were working with a speed controller we didn't know it was an open source platform it wasn't very highly documented how this speed controller worked and we had to tune it using some open source software configurator. And then we also needed to figure out how to install sensors that would interface with this electronic speed controller inside of motors that were large and, uh, you know, we, we hadn't really worked with them before. So the, the trickiest parts that we ended up learning and figuring out were that uh, these motors are 42 pole, or it's it, they had 42 magnets, they were 21 pole motors, which, was very different from most uh, brushless motors that you would buy, which end up, which I think are 14 instead of 42. Uh, so that made the magnets uh, spacing different. And then there, the other challenge was they're in an aluminum can. And when we tried to make a Hall effect sensor board that would go on the outside of the motor can, for some reason, it wasn't detecting, it, the, the magnets were, were not, triggering the sensors. So we actually had to take the motor apart, cut out parts of it, and then design a really, really compact PCB that could fit inside of the motor body in order to detect those magnets as they were spinning around. And we ended up getting it in and getting it to work, but man, was it tricky and it was really touchy. Because of the 42 pole setup, like even moving the sensor board within the motor body was like, you could move it an almost visually indiscernible amount, you know, and you're just adjusting it kind of by hand, you know, you're very carefully pushing it to try and get it into, into that position that works. Um, so yeah, that was tricky. That was very tricky. Um, interestingly, in the end, we decided to switch to a different brand of electronic speed controllers. And those ones were like night and day difference. So a big learning point here was that the, the quality and, and design of the electronic speed controller can actually make a huge difference on how the the, the motors actually perform. Yeah, and actually, um, I, I think that from from like yeah a more like the technical electric side of things that was definitely a, a big one. But one thing I, I think um, may kind of get overlooked is is just like logistical challenge, especially given. Um, our team, we're all we're all located in different cities. So we're all doing this design work and everything remotely, um, and we only really only come together um, as a team for you know a couple of weeks to to get this entire robot really fully assembled, built, tested, and everything. Um, and although you know the past couple of years have trended and made this more commonplace, really being effective with um, doing design work remotely and and you know figuring out how to and off tasking, be efficient with everyone's, you know, skills, time and everything is, is, um, definitely something that's more unique to us as a BattleBots team versus a lot of the other teams that are probably more centrally located. Um, and to kind of address that, you know, this is something we've kind of been iterating on and, and working throughout, you know, our smaller 30 pound robots and everything and up until now, but we try to utilize a lot of like design reviews. Um, and come together on a, on a regular cadence and, and really trying to, you know, utilize each other's inputs, um, iterate and, and go through, you know, the full standard, you know, engineering design process, but, um, being particularly sensitive to, you know, communication and, and challenges that, 
that end up becoming a thing um, when you're trying to like design physical mechanical hardware, but everyone's remote and just dealing with a computer. Um, and then basically, you know, the the additional logistical challenge when it comes to you know sourcing everything and and scheduling on a very tight time frame this tends to happen with with these events to to just work out everything on a really quick pace but making sure that all the moving parts are kind of in the right order and line up such that, you know, there is a functional robot that does what we want it to do um, by the time we're heading to competition. Yeah. And yeah, I just I want would... to add to that. It's interestingly difficult to uh, lift, operate, work on, and make changes to a 250 pound robot by yourself. So inevitably we have to orchestrate all of the parts and things coming in and try to do as much as we can beforehand. But in the end, like the, the robots here in my garage, but I can only do so much until we have all of the other guys come in. And, um, you know, that's just, it's very challenging to do that. The size of the, of the robot makes it difficult as well to work on. Yeah. And I think the, uh, the working remote is looking at our backgrounds here is something that we all, uh, can relate to a little bit in our professional lives. And I'm sure plenty of the people watching along can as well. Um, and as much as I would love to take the uh, segue, Alex seemed to be teaming up about why Fictive's so great. I'm not gonna go that route because I have another question that I'm really curious about, which could probably be a whole webinar in itself, but the the arm, the actual, you know, the lift part of deadlift. Um, if you guys wanna tell me, just talk a little bit about, you know, why why that type of arm uh what was like you know some of the the challenges and improvements that uh came up with that design and that you've iterated on over the course of this uh this robot yeah i guess uh mike you want to kick us off with that one and then maybe ryan follow up sure um so uh as you might have seen in our in our previous photos from the competitions that we've been at before um with not only vertical spinners, but also horizontal spinners and just kind of, you know, rotating, rotating uh, weapons in general. Um, Matt, I think, was the only one that really had a, a control style design. So it was a new challenge for, for most of us. Um, I think for anyone who also watches uh, the BattleBots TV show, um, you kind of know that most of the robots are spinning type robots. And so I think not only having a a type of robot that is is new and challenging for us, but also one that is more more unique or, or less common than a lot of other types of robots, provided us with something that that you know was something that was new and interesting and exciting for a lot of us to kind of take on. Um, for the actual uh, arm itself, um, we learned a lot in the in the first year that we did it. Um, with with BattleBots, we didn't really we hadn't really competed in this weight class before. We hadn't really li um, made a, a lifter type of, of robot before. So we can uh, we, we made design choices that we thought were correct at the time, but you know, in engineering, as you know, <clears throat> you you design, you test, and then you iterate. And and we learned that the type of arms that we had built in the previous year weren't quite structurally rigid enough for what we were looking for. Um, and then this year, we 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 expanded upon our previous design by making by switching from two kind of thicker steel slabs that would come out to a, a welded steel design that would make it more robust by being a more tubular design. So it was stiffer and in, in bending. Um, and and this design that you see here on screen, where it's more of a clamping type of of design. Yeah, and I can kind of take over here and um, kind of go more into the design challenges of this um, with the grabber configuration that we have. Um, so this design that you see on the screen right now, um, one of the biggest challenges is actually because you're picking up another robot and because both robots weigh roughly 250 pounds, you have a big issue with picking up the robot without tipping forward yourself. Because um, as you grab the other robot, the whole system becomes um, all together, the center of gravity can be over the front of your robot. So that causes the robot to tip forward. So what you need is some type of like support that comes out from the front of your own robot 
that can keep the robot from tipping, but also is strong enough that it can take all the hits because since you're going to be using this going, you know, face forward into the other robot that's most likely a spinner, um, it needs to be able to handle those impacts there, as well as the arm itself that needs to handle the impacts. Um, so that was one of the biggest design challenges in kind of going with this lifter grabber type design. Um, not to mention now that we have a second arm on top to grab the other robot, we have to have weight allocated to that as well. Um, so that means either taking off, taking armor away from somewhere. Um, or just, you know, really making this top portion of the arm very thin and fragile. Um, what we ended up doing was kind of a combination where we really tried to make it as rigid as possible by taking weight out. And you can see in the picture, there's a lot of cutouts um, in the front and like the top arm framing. And uh, as Mike mentioned in the uh, design that we have kind of a tubular frame that's um, welded together. Um, try to make it as strong as possible, but also make it as light as possible. Um, and then also we have to make sure that, you know, in the front of the arm, so in this picture, the, what the tire is basically resting on is also another steel plate um, that also takes impacts as another spinner comes up. That's probably what's going to hit first. Um, so we had to make sure that was extremely strong. So as you can see, there's just a lot of weight that needs to be added there. And a lot of that weight is in front of the robot, which also causes the robot to want to tip again. So what we had to end up doing is kind of push the whole, make the whole frame longer. So as you see, like our frame is a little bit longer than it is wide. And that allows us to have the center gravity of our robot further back in the robot. So that way, when we go to grab the robot, the um, total center gravity of the system then moves more towards where our front wedges are, the front armor there. That way, when we grab them, uh, we don't, you know, tip forward. Instead, we can actually grab them and flip them over our back. Um, and then, you know, while we're doing that, we're using the flame that's uh, mounted there, and it looks really cool and everything. So, <laughs> cool. Well, all that talk about, uh, you know, picking up robots and center of gravity, moving them, uh, has made me uh, very curious about you know, these things actually being in action because I, uh, you know, didn't have cable uh, TV pretty much ever. So I never got to watch BattleBots, sadly. So as someone who's never seen it, what is the actual competition like? Like, uh, you know, competitive, but how would you guys describe what it's like to be there and actually uh, trying to, as you said, uh, beat the crap out of someone else's hard work? Yeah, I can take this one. <clears throat> so the BattleBots competition in general, it's, uh, if I had to say a single word, it's, intense um you know like we've talked about previously we had competed you know in some smaller tournaments kind of across the country for many years but when you go to battle bots you are fighting against the best of the best and you are fighting against the best of the best who have you know poured a lot of money a lot of time and a lot of iterations into it so when we were on battle bots you know it was up to season five at that point so you know we're fighting with our brand new design against people who might have had five seasons of experience up on us. And so it's a definitely an uphill battle when you go there. Um, you got to you know, really bring your A game. And it's important that you be able to fix your problems on the fly. Um, you know, when we went to the competition for the first year, and we were just totally lost. We basically showed up there with our robot, and our, then we just went up to him and said, all right, what do we do now? <laughs> and, uh, you know, luckily the staff was very helpful in that aspect. But it was certainly a, a learning experience getting there for the first time, understanding how the logistics of the show work, um, you know, getting your fight ramp up. Um, it's awesome to have the big production. That was the first time uh, we had gone to a tournament where it's televised, where there's a huge production crew. Uh, you know, you're getting professionally announced. Um, the fights are getting professionally, uh, you know, commentated on by the broadcasters. So um, it was definitely a lot of fun, definitely very intense, a lot of stressful moments, especially when stuff doesn't work. Um, you you kind of got to keep a cool head and you know, you're, you're there for two weeks, which is a long time for a robotics competition. Um, and you know, you know when you're when you're ready to go, it can be totally boring, just kind of sitting and waiting for your tournament uh, fight to go on. Or when you're you're absolutely cranking the wrench as fast as humanly possible, it's uh, extremely intense, extremely stressful, but overall a very uh, a very fun experience. Yeah. And, so, Dan, do you, I'm sorry to interrupt, but Dan, do you mind touching on too kind of your thoughts during a match when you're driving as well? Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I can certainly do that. So yeah, as a driver of deadlift, uh, I certainly have a good amount of responsibility on my shoulders. Um, I will say, um, 
in general, I try not to get nervous. I try not to, uh, I try not to, um, you know, keep a, keep a steady mental, right? But uh, let me tell you, when, when the lights are on, when the box is locked, uh, it's stressful. I, uh, I definitely, I feel the adrenaline pumping through my veins every time I walk up to that box. I always think that I look very nervous on camera. Apparently, it's maybe some other people don't think that as much, but um, uh, it is an area, very interesting experience because, you know, you feel all that adrenaline lean up to the match, and then right when the match starts, it's kind of just like totally in the zone, focused. You don't think about anything else. You don't think about the crowd or the commentating. You just look at their robot. You look at your robot, and you, you manipulate it as best you can. So what is the, how does the actual competition work, like when – you know, you're, you're waiting, you're going, you're waiting, you're going, but you know, uh, how does it work? How do you get to be the, the top one, the winner? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I guess, um, let's see, Matt, do you want to, you want to try to tackle that one? Yeah. So, uh, for, for battle bots, which is a little bit different than your standard, uh, Comet robotics tournament, they have a main season where you get fight card fights and those are, you know, picked and set up by the producers and they try to make some exciting matches happen via that selection. And then everyone gets two or three fights, at least in the most recent season, but it varies from season to season. And based on your performance in those fights, you could make it into the knockout tournament. And the knockout tournament is 32 robots and it's a single elimination tournament. So that's the overall structure of the, of the tournament. And within each match, it's a three minute match and it, your goal is to knock out the opponent robot and knocking out is basically just defined as the other robot is no longer able to move in a meaningful way. Um, so like if you took off three of their wheels and they only have one wheel left and all they can do is like wiggle and the robot can't even translate, that would be considered a knockout despite them still having some functional systems left in the robot. Um, and you know, knocking out a robot could be flipping it upside down and it can't get back onto its wheels or, you know, um, it, 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 it can kind of vary what a knockout is, but fundamentally the other robot can no longer move. Um, if that doesn't happen in the middle of the three minute match, then it goes to a judge's decision and the judging categories also will vary from competition to competition, but for battle bots, they judge it on damage control and aggression. And they'll allocate points to each of the robots based on these categories. And there's three judges and they each do this and then they add up the total points and whichever robot had the most judging points wins that particular match. Cool. So then it sounds like you guys have been, you know, through, through uh, a couple of battles, I'd say, uh, through a little bit. Um, what's kind of the, you know, I know the new season's coming out soon, so no spoilers, please, because I'm, I know I'm uh, getting a Discovery Plus uh, subscription for this one. Um, but what's kind of next? Like, what are you guys either looking or thinking about changing, thinking about tweaking, improving, uh, trying to overcome next? Yeah, that's always, uh, you know, that's always a little bit of the secret sauce. You know, you don't want to reveal too much. But Ryan, why don't you talk about, in, I guess, a vague sense, what uh, our plans for the future are? Yeah, I, I can't talk too many specifics, but um, I know we, we are definitely looking forward to applying once again for um, the next season of BattleBots. Um, and we're looking to kind of tweak the design that we've been um, showing these past two years with Bedlift. Um, so we're actually creating, we're in the process of creating some smaller scale prototypes to see if this kind of our new concept would be feasible um, at the larger scale and if it actually works period. But um, it's kind of going along the lines of what we discussed earlier where, you know, keep it as simple as possible. And uh, we feel like this new design could be simple yet um, effective at dishing out a lot of damage. So. We'll, we'll leave it as a little teaser for everyone here to uh, stay tuned for our next endeavors. And uh, I will, to build off Ryan's statement there, say that uh, this, this, this new um, you know, modifications to design will be a never before seen on BattleBots type of design. So Ooh. just to build up a little hype there. Oh, color me excited. Right. All right. Well, as I said earlier, we uh, we wanted to make sure we leave some time for questions from the audience, seeing as they're the, the reason we're here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and run through some of the Q&A uh, we've gotten thus far and haven't addressed. But if anyone out there has any other questions, uh, now's the time to ask them. 
So the first one that uh, I think is a very interesting one, very engineering, is uh, how much actual analysis and calculation goes into designing and building the robot versus testing. Like, are you guys spending hours in FEA figuring out the exact right design, or is it more a uh, and build it, hit it with a hammer, see what happens. <laughs> well, I think there's definitely some some differences of opinion, but Alex, why don't you take that question? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a fantastic question because it, it's it's one of those things where depending on um, how much resources and time is a resource, money is a resource, right, all that, um, it really drives kind of the, the process when it comes to, yes, designing, analyzing, testing, et cetera. Um, and I will say, like, even like among the BattleBots teams, it, def it definitely varies a lot. Um, for us, it's, 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 again, it's a thing of, like, balance and, and optimizing for, like, our team size, our resources, and everything, and the fact that, yeah, we're all remote. Like, logistically, it's, it's, it's difficult to do some things. So um, I would say um, it's, from, from analysis goes, I mean, we have our, you know, kind of straightforward, initial approach of like, you know, hand calcs, figuring out like power density, you know, motor requirements, all that sort of stuff. Um, and, and we touched on that earlier, like ensuring that, you know, the design, especially in a lifter sense, is going to do what you want it to do. Um, as well as, yeah, drivetrain, you know, speed, acceleration, all that, all that great stuff. Um, and then it comes down to like some of the more of the detailed design components, whether it be like, you know, optimizing for weight reduction, strength, strength to weight, you know, we keep on touching on that. Um, using, yeah, more, you know, FAA tools to um, not necessarily know exactly, you know, the loading considerations, because once you start diving into, like, these crazy, powerful, hard-hitting, you know, momentum-based spinning weapons, it, it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of like a, a black magic type deal of how hard things are hitting and what the energy transfer is going to be and all that. But even without going to that extreme, just understanding, you know, the differences between how designs will perform at different loading conditions help us drive like final geometry relative to your space claim and, and everything and, and basically trade offs of yes, armor versus, you know, extremities, the lifter arm, etc. Um, and then an interesting thing about BattleBots is, you know, when it comes down to it, we never really know how th something's gonna perform until it's like really in the arena. Um, because yeah, there are these crazy hard hitting robots you know, um, anything that could potentially happen does end up happening. It's just kind of like the law of battle bots. And so you could have parts flying off or, or robots getting stuck in weird places and whatnot. And so it's, it's really hard to, it's very difficult to, to, to kind of plan ahead and, and figure out like everything. But from a, you know, isolated testing for various different subsystems or, you know, trying to improve things from a lot of trying for busness standpoint. Um, we do what we can there. And, and realistically, what will happen, you, you kind of see this as well between, you know, last year and this year for us, but over the years for other competitors is like every fight is a very critical test. And, you know, you try to learn as much as possible from each fight, each event, and apply those learnings um, either to the same robot or realistically like, we've been learning a lot of lessons and everything from all our smaller robots. And there's a lot of things from like testing at a small scale that we end up implementing, you know, for each of our new robots, including deadlift. So I understand it's kind of like a, a broad answer, but, but it's like, again, it's just the balance and trying to figure out, you know, how much actual testing can be done versus from time and money and, and balancing that with kind of like the tuition or general like engineering approach. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think I think building off of that, um, kind of like what Alex was saying was that we're all remote. Uh, it's very hard to test a robot of that scale in any capacity safely. Um, and since since we don't have a lot of time together, we still have to build the robot, assemble it. Um, we we don't have a whole lot of time to test the robot in the off season. Nor do we really have the facilities to to undergo the stress testing we would need to act, like to accurately simulate an actual fight. So there are a couple of days when we get to BattleBots where they'll have cages set up. These are, are polycarbonate, you know, half inch thick polycarbonate cages that they have set up for us where we can we can test the robot 
at higher functional loads. They'll have you know a 250 pound truck tire that we can try to pick up and lift. For the spinner bots, they'll also have targets that they can try to hit against. But, but like Kitty was saying, the the actual tests um, is very hard to replicate with the the resources that we have, and and most of the times the actual fights themselves are the tests, and we build and iterate off of those. All right, I'll go ahead and roll into our next question, uh, which is one I'm actually very curious about because we haven't really touched on the fact that in addition to, you know, the, the beefy robot arm, your robot has a flamethrower, uh, which <laughs> oh, yeah, flamethrowers a... obviously make everything cooler, just like lasers. It's a known fact of life. But the question is, uh, how effective is the flamethrower actually? Is it there for intimidation or does it really help and does it even ever pose a threat to itself? Yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> As the uh, flamethrower architect of the team, I guess I can uh, tackle this one. So if actually if you want to bring up slide 10, which is a, just a very interesting picture, um, the common wisdom would be to say that flamethrowers in general, they don't, they don't do a whole lot. Uh, however, the more and more we use it, the more and more we learn about it. I mean, actually, the reason that we added it in the first place was not to do any damage. I mean, because, again, when we first built it, we were thinking, you know, it looks cool. And looking cool is about nine-tenths of the reason that you ever get on BattleBots. Um, BattleBots is a competition, but it is also primarily a TV show. So, you know, you got to look good on the camera. And flamethrowers are a very easy, cheap way to look good. Um, but as we've continued using the flamethrower, you know, we didn't expect it to do a lot, but it's it surprised us. I'll say that. Uh, I mean, you can tell from some of these pictures, those flames, they are hot and they go very far, especially if you got the robot like pinned up against the wall or something and you're just absolutely torching them. I mean, the flames are really getting up in there. And when you consider that these robots are essentially optimized to work for three minutes and three minutes only because any additional threshold is just extra weight that you put into your robot for no reason. So things heat up quickly. I mean, we, we've done any number of things. We have lit belts on fire. We've burned out solenoids. We've over, overheated people's motors. Um, so while on the surface, it actually looks like the flamethrower wouldn't do a whole lot because you're blasting it into a giant block of metal, which is essentially what the other robot is, it, it, it'll surprise you time and again. I'll say that. Yeah, so oh, it's especially effective other... because... Go ahead, Mike. Oh, go ahead, Dan. Oh, uh, a lot of the way other robots tend to weight reduce, like Dan was saying, is by uh, having structural cutouts, kind of like you see in our arm here, but on their actual frame itself, which allows us to more effectively heat up enemy electronics, which is kind of the main weak point, along with belts, like Dan was saying. I just wanted to add that part in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting, and this is something that, you know, we've certainly picked up from competing in smaller weight classes leading up to BattleBots, that I would say perhaps even a majority of matches are lost due to electronic component failures or poor electronic uh, planning of some kind. Like, you'll see, um, you know, you don't see this as much at BattleBots because of the caliber of the competition, but at a lot of the other smaller events, a robot might just kind of stop driving. And you're like, huh, I wonder what happened. Some kind of an electronic component failed, and often that, that is the result of heat. As uh, someone who's uh, inherited a laser cutter that was set on fire, I can go ahead and confirm that fire does do very bad things to electronics and belts <laughs> and everything. Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, so to kind of roll into that and things being on fire and durable and what, you know, what breaks, um, we had a question about materials, which I'm curious about as we've helped make the parts um, of you know, what materials do you guys use? Is it, you know, we're talking about blocks of aluminum, blocks of steel. Is it mostly that or do you have anything, you know, kind of crazy exotic in there like chromoly, titanium, unobtainium, anything fun? <laughs> Dan, you're on mute. Oh, I apologize. Sorry. No, that's a, that's a great question about materials. Uh, Ryan, do you want to tackle that one? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, so we don't use too many exotic materials. Um, unfortunately, titanium is usually out of our budget. Um, I know there's some teams that do use it, and it's if you have money for it, it's very, very effective um, as far as the strength to weight uh, ratio goes. 
Um, but we do tend to be picky about what kind of alloys we use as far as our aluminum and steel goes. Um, for aluminum, we've used a few different types of aluminum in the past, and some are more feasible at even different weight classes than others. Um, we kind of settled on deadlift using just a regular 6061 um, engineering um, grade aluminum. Um, it tends to be more uh, like pliable, uh, so when it gets hit by a spinner, it doesn't just crack instantly, um, as opposed to using like a um, 7075 aluminum or uh, I believe 2021 uh, was the other one that we used. Um, I can't remember the exact number on that one. 2024, um, thank you. Um, so we, we settled at least for all of aluminum using 6061, um, even though like the 7075 is aircraft grade, um, and it's a bit stiffer for its weight. Um, we just found that under these extreme impacts from other spinners that it tends to crack more easily, um, and break in that fashion. Um, for steels, we tend to use, um, heat treated steels, um, and we'll use, I know in the, uh, some of our wetlands we use, uh, chromoly. Um, for that. Uh, it just gives us a little bit extra strength. Um, and we usually, the biggest thing about that is getting the right heat treat um, uh, hardness for it. Uh, there's like a sweet spot where you don't want to be too hard, otherwise it'll crack under impacts. You don't want to be too soft, otherwise it's going to bend and, you know, just look like butter after these fights. Um, so we, we usually try to like hit that nice range of like, I, I would say like a 48 to 52 C hardness um which um sometimes is tough to get chromoly up to so we'll use like a um tool steel sometimes uh, i know we use s7 tool steel on our weapons in the past um so you know it's basically comes down to we use pretty standard engineering grade aluminum and then we use um, more specific alloys for our steel on our robots cool all right. Well, we've got three minutes left, uh, so I'm going to be a little selfish and take the last question for myself. Uh, so in two minutes, uh, if someone tell me what is your guys uh, most memorable moment in all of your years of, uh, you know, combat robots with this uh, with deadlift? Hard question. Quick answer. See if you can pull it off. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just go with a quick one here. I, I have to say, I think the most satisfying moment for me was probably... Uh, season five, BattleBots, uh, Bounty Hunters, episodes available on Discovery Plus, <laughs> and uh, it was probably the first time that we saw Deadlift working 100% flamethrower perfect, drive perfect, lifter perfect. It was our match against um, uh, Ghost Raptor, and then further our match against Jackpot. I think those were probably the the best moments for me. Yeah, the background to that was that you know we had like I was mentioning earlier with our electronics that we were using, we were having troubles and we had to swap everything out. We had rush ordered things overnight delivery. We had built a whole new harness for the robot and basically we had gutted it and gotten all these new electronics put in more or less overnight. So uh, it was a big, big rush to try and fix things. And the payoff was awesome when we saw how much better the robot was performing after that. Cool. Yeah, right. there's some more memorable moments too uh, for this season that we can't say yet, so everyone yeah. needs to watch. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll go ahead and take that uh, segue and uh, thank you guys uh, once again for coming and chatting. This was a lot of fun. I know I'm uh, really proud that there are parts that Fictives helped made in this robot. I um, hope they're serving you well. Uh, thank you to the audience for coming and uh, enjoying this little chat with us. Uh, it was lovely having you. Thanks to Asmi for actually hosting. And uh, if you guys want to see more of this, see uh, you know this robot we've been talking about for the past hour in action, uh, check it out on Discovery Plus. The uh, next season airs on January 6th, I believe. Uh, I know I'll be tuning in uh, with a big bowl of popcorn. Um, and I hope you all do as well. So once again, thanks so much to everyone and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Oh, and it is also on the Discovery Channel as well if you're one of those people who has uh, cable TV still. All right, thanks all again. Have a good day. All right. Thank you, David. Thanks for having us.